This is in the front row. <laughs> Blocking all the views. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Million of people there. Can I do it without a microphone? Do you hear me well? Yeah? If not, just tell me. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Sharon Gabriello. Uh, I'm from Israel. And I'm the co-founder and artistic director of Safe Place Festival, which is a festival for relaxed performances. Um, I'm very excited because usually I do this with my partner, um, and now I'm doing it by myself. So. Maybe it will take five minutes, <laughs> maybe 30 minutes, I don't know. We'll just, you know, go with the flow, <laughs> yeah? Um, but at the end of the session, I want to hear your questions, if you have any, or maybe have a discussion, and mainly hear about inclusion in your country. It really intrigues me. Okay, so. So the 
first part is why does the world need relaxed performances? Uh, and what made us do this end to end? Who is our audience? <laughs> this is Eyal. He's five years old and he's autistic. Every time his parents took him to see a children's show, he had to leave, mainly because of his behavior, which didn't suit the society and the rules. But last week, for the first time in his life, he enjoyed a full theater show that suited to AI. Um, you probably know that due to their uh, unique needs and through no fault of their own, uh, children on the autistic spectrum are left out of cultural activities that for most children are trivial and routine. Children on the spectrum may feel anxiety, uh, sensory or emotional overload for a variety of reasons that we take for granted. Uh, be it the loud volume of the sound in a show, uh, frequent lighting changes, or simply a large audience. Um, all, all those may trigger reactions that oftentimes are constructed as noisy, uh, disruptive, or uh, violent, and that's why many families uh, just pass this joyride. In Israel, 2019, there are approximately 3,000 children uh, on the autistic spectrum. I'm talking about children that are diagnosed. Um, about 300,000 are in special education. And more close to our matter, why are we doing this? Every year, about 50 new TYA productions are produced. Now, I have a question. How many of those shows do you think um, are suitable for children on the autistic spectrum and other cognitive disabilities. What do you think? Five. Two. Five. Five. Two. Five. Vicky. One. One. Why one? <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Interesting, Danny, because the answer is zero. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> that's the reality. <laughs> but I'm not here to make you sad, guys. It has a happy end. In 18, in, in, uh, in the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> in 2018, we started our first Safe Place Festival. Okay, we're already in part two. That's amazing. <laughs> so, um, what is a relaxed performance festival? I think it, I skipped a, wait, I'll go to this one. Yes, so Safe Place, Place is a festival, uh, uh, it's a fully inclusive theater festival where any behavior is okay, not judged, and any reaction is acceptable. This means children can come in and out of a show as they want, walk freely in the venue, and make noises or any physical gestures as they need. All performances have been adapted and different elements that may cause an overload have been removed. I'll get uh, deeper into that in the next, uh, in the upcoming uh, minutes. Um, so I'm gonna go back to this, uh, how it all began actually. Um, <clears throat> so Safe Place um, is, was the first time that this type of festival ever took place in Israel and today it is the only annual festival in the world, I think, unless anyone knows anything I don't know, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, so it's the only festival <laughs> in the world right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I forgot to say, we're live streaming, hello. <laughs> yes. And speak louder, great. So uh, if, hi all if you're watching, and my only friend that is watching, hi. Bye <laughs> <laughs> um, bye, it's the only festival in the world, blah, blah, blah. Yes, dedicated to theater shows and for children on the autistic spectrum and other uh, neurodivergent uh, differences. My partner, all, I'm not doing this alone, thankfully, and, and the co-founder could not be here because in Israel, the school, school year starts on uh, September 1st. Um, so she had to be with her son, who is autistic. Um, 
my daughter also started a new kindergarten, but she's autistic, uh, so I'm here. <laughs> um, I would like to indicate before I go further that our initiative is under, um, it's been adopted by the Association for Children at Risk uh, for Autism Treatment and Research Center, and it provides us uh, in our initiative a strategic and professional guidance and support through its communication therapists, occupation therapists, and psychologists, uh, all of whom are experts in autism. Okay, so we had a dream. We went to New York. Uh, we took part in the Big Umbrella Festival, um, and we studied there in their uh, professional development. We came back to Israel, and after three months, our festival was born. And all the tickets were sold out within a week, for some shows within a day. Um, so before I go even deeper, I just, I want to give you an introduction of uh, the first festival, which happened August 2018. I need to go to the YouTube. First uh, festival was in the uh, Tel Aviv Museum. museum. <laughs> So, um, as, so what do I do? What's my work? Um, as part of my fascinating job as our project's artistic director, I get to meet theater artists. <laughs> <laughs> Can you call someone to start? Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, I get to meet theater artists and select shows that may be adapted and modified into relaxed performances. Now, uh, in Israel, like in most countries, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Ellie. You should, you should stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, in Israel, like in most countries, there isn't a show that is made from scratch for this kind of audience. So what I do is I go through the year and watch shows, and I pick a show that uh, can be adapted, that has like a natural way towards this audience anyway. So 
the adaptations can be as minor as I can make them. Um, um, I work separately with each production and artists, and the main part is making it every show as sensory as possible. So naturally, the, the adaptation doesn't cover the content of the show alone. Uh, it manifests itself as an all-encompassing accessibility framework that includes pre-show inductory materials uh, for the families and the children, and I will, I will show you about that later on. A crew of uh, volunteers. It's the next slide. Yeah, a crew of volunteers. Uh, that they are present during the shows. A quiet space uh, the chil children may use if they experience some sort of, uh, some form of sensory or emotional overload. So it means that outside every venue, whatever the venue is, so outside there will be a quiet space. Um, it is a calm, tolerant space that one may come in or out of throughout the show all according to the child's needs. Uh, we do our best to select a venue that may transform itself to become relaxed, starting with clear signs at every corner, uh, a team of volunteers. We cannot have this festival without volunteers. They are like the ground base of it. Um, a team of, go of uh, sorry, I lost my, uh, uh, that they are accompanying the, the families and the children. Um, and they are, sorry, in any way, and uh, up to silis, silencing the hand dryers in the toilets as to prevent the triggering of any fears. The field of relaxed performances around the world today is still in its infancy, but one may detect a rising interest and openness to the matter. Uh, these days, more and more theater and artists and community centers and more realize that to include <coughs> everyone, they must also make room for cognitive accessibility. Now, when we create a relaxed space that factors all this in, we have a fantastic opportunity to give these children those moments of pure joy that only happen in the theater. Uh, the apparent effect on children who watch a show for the first time and may behave how they like without judgment, glares, or social criticism is an exciting experience, not only for them, but for their families. They can finally breathe and, and we can enjoy such an outing and enjoy it together. <coughs> so one of the principles that lead me is finding the best and most respectful performances in Israel and uh, most professional. And this is something I will not compromise or uh, I will not settle for anything less. Uh, for example, I have, you know, every art artistic director has its vision and its and his way. Um, like commercial shows, it's not really my thing. So I wouldn't adapt a commercial show. Um, it, it should be super amazing or unique in order for me to start working with them. But I can give you an example that in New York, in, in Broadway, they have relaxed performances they, uh, for musicals, like The Lion King, for example. Uh, it's an audience for like 700 uh, people. Uh, but yeah, you, have, you can have a show for five children, you can have a show for 700. Uh, it's all about the approach, I guess. And in our festival, we try to, to give all the options. Okay. So I was uh, talking about some of the things, the, the things that uh, help us um, through the shows, like these are uh, accessories that we put uh, outside of every uh, show. It's stress balls, it's uh, those headphones, the ear, uh, the sound, soundproof headphones um, that we provide, everyone can use it. 
this is our special table. So when you come to our festival, it doesn't matter where we are, because we don't have our venues, yeah? Uh, last, the first festival was in the Museum of Tel Aviv. The second festival, which was last week, by the way, uh, was in the Cinematheque of Tel Aviv. Now, they are all huge institutes, okay, that are trying to fit us in. And these huge, and it's August, and the children, most of, everyone is on vacation, and there's no school, so inside all of that, we need to make our space in all this uh, hectic place. So the families that purchase the tickets to the show, we don't go to the cashier of the Cinematheque, okay? We, we have our, our spot, our table, and with, with our, all our signs and volunteers, of course. So what you can see here, and I will pass it, have it here live now. Yeah. Um, every show has a social story. Uh, do, do, does anyone, like, is there someone here that doesn't know what is a social story? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Christian. No, it's much easier uh, for me. Uh, it's a visual information sort of a pamphlet and a toolkit that supplies the background of the entire show. And it's listing all the scenes, a visual and a literal breakdown of the characters, set and props in the show. This way, the children can prepare in advance with their families. And it also lowers the level of fear and uncertainty, elements that might trigger anxiety and overloads with these special children. By the way, it, it's suitable for all the kids. You don't have to be autistic, but you know. So we have like a general social story, I will pass it, uh, which uh, these are uh, icons uh, that uh, someone, we hire a professional to, to make these stories. So this is a general social story of what happens when I come to the theater. Um, so I might see many people, I'll sit uh, next to my guardian and I'll, I will try to wait with, uh, with patience through the show, I can check my social story, what will happen. Um, I can look, I can listen, and I will talk quietly. If I need help, um, I can point to those icons and maybe ask for help. And in the venue, there are a nice volunteers that can help. So you can pass it, pass it along. Um, and this is a social story for a show. As I said, every show that we adapt gets its own social story. So this is uh, just the beginning of a breakdown of the scenes. And we have to be very specific with the end for children, autistic children, so they need to, um, as, as we said before, just to, to know the breakdown and to know what's going on and when is it going to end. So we need to be very, very specific. Um, this year, we added um, some stickers to our table. Uh, so there's the red sticker, um, which says, I prefer not to be approached. I think I could wear it every day. <laughs> <laughs> there's the uh, green sticker that says, um, I can talk, but I'm not al always able to to lead a conversation. And there's the photograph, because you know a lot of families, they, they want to keep it private and don't take pictures of our children and don't post it on Facebook. Or So it really helped us this year, because we, we, do, we document everything, so. This is um, our quiet space. So this year we decided to have tents and we put them all around the Cinematheque. Uh, it does look ugly. I know the aesthetics is not amazing. I, I didn't want it to look like uh, camping, mm -hmm. so we just added uh, those uh, fabrics. Um, but inside, you have a lot of sensory uh, toys for the children, and um, uh, even costumes. So a lot of children would just put on themselves hats and costumes, and uh, big pillows like this. So every time a child feels like maybe he's too tired or it's too much or he's 
going to have a meltdown, you can just go outside and relax. Um, I'm just going to show you a few of the shows we had this year in our program. Uh, some were uh, specifically tailored for the festival and some in the rest of the shows are amazing shows that were adapted and now they have their own version as a relaxed performance. So this was tailored for the festival. It's just uh, a bubble, uh, a soap bubble uh, workshop for the whole family. And I, I think that was like the greatest success. Mm -hmm. um, so Lee, she's an actor. She did the whole workshop as a, as a character. Uh, but I think the, it was so popular because again, it was an activity for the whole family, which is something <coughs> they hardly experience. Uh, this was just uh, a storytelling for the young ones. We limit the amount of audience in every uh, um, activity. So the, we limited here uh, the amount for 15 uh, people. Uh, this is one of the shows. Now, all the, the regular shows, the theater shows, they were in the Cinematheque venue, which is on a daily basis. It's uh, cinema so you have those chairs and there is a stage the perform the performances were on the stage uh, but the but the children uh, two amazing things happened uh, because in our first festival all the shows were in this like open big room and there were no chairs and they could go around and, and run and do whatever and because we only had this this year, so most of the children were really concentrated and they were just sitting for 45 minutes. That was amazing. amazing. And the rest of the children and the families, they were like, again, we, we, um, we limit the amount of audience. So we limit it to 60, okay? This venue is suitable for 150, if I'm not mistaken. So it feels empty and they spread it all around the chairs, um, which is great because they just, they can feel comfortable to go and to sit wherever they want. And, but you can see some kids uh, moving closer on a row and then another row. And then at the end, they were just in the front row in front of the show, which is, it's a great deal. It's, for us, it's like trivial. But, uh, so this is a sweet child holding a social story. It gives a lot of confidence to know what's happening next. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> another special activity we had is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, sensory clowning. So it's, it was this, with this sweet clown. So every, it was open for one child and a caretaker and they had 10 minutes of activity. This was, uh, you didn't have to pay for this. We just gave it to the family. You just have to register uh, up front. Um, and there's a, there's a timer working for 10 minutes. And then, and they also, they have a social story for that too. But the only difference in this activity is that they can choose which activity from the social story uh, they want. And again, this, this was tailored especially for the festival and it was uh, there was a long queue, and everyone really liked it. Uh, that's another show. That was um, our poster. Oh, I, I missed the... Uh, oh, no, I did. Okay. Um, Blah, 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 blah. Yes. I'm in my uh, third part of the lectures. Okay. Uh, so in, my, in this last part, I want to tell you about the collaborations that we made this year. Because what happened after the first festival, it was like a dam was breached. And we got so many uh, call-outs and parents writing us can you please come to the north? Can you please come to the 
Well, you don't see trees so much in, in, in <laughs> Come to the north, come to the south. Uh, we, want, we, we, we want it in our village, we want it in our city, and we had to like rethink it uh, from the beginning. And, and then it, it started not to only be a festival, it just became an in initiative. And we started thinking of how can we uh, bring, bring it more to, to the people. And we are only two, two women that do it alone. And what can we do? Um, so the first collaboration uh, we did uh, since, yeah, sorry, I just got lost in my text. So I'm going to go back and find it. Okay. So, um, we now believe that every, uh, no, I will say it by heart. The first collaboration we did is we went to the three largest and, and most, um, the three largest festival, theater festivals in Israel, which are uh, in Haifa, in Hulon, and in Jerusalem. Um, and we, we asked them, would you like to collaborate with us? You just open a slot in your, in your program to a relaxed performance, okay? We will take care of the slot, okay? We will, like in our festival, we will, br we will bring the table, we will bring the tent, we will bring the volunteers, we will help you with the, the description and all the accurate text for the PR and for the program. Uh, you just need to say yes. And they did, and it was amazing, and again, the demand was crazy because all the shows were just sold out. Now I know for part of them, it's not for the, um, maybe it's not, they don't do it for the same reason that we do it. They just, they really need the PR or maybe. But it doesn't matter because from now on, um, they will always have a slot in their program for relaxed performances. And these are festivals that are existing more than 30 years. So it was uh, great. And, and I really think that just as it is mandatory by law to provide physical accessibility for people with physical disabilities, so it should be cognitive uh, accessibility. This way we're paving the way to a better and more in inclusive future. Uh, and we really believe that every festival in the world should do it, <laughs> really. And uh, it's really simple. So that was the first collaboration that we did. And the second one, uh, in Israel, as part of the yearly education plan, there's a, we call it a cultural basket. So it means basically that every educational institute, uh, which means schools and kindergarten, they get to see a variety of cultural shows chosen by the educational staff. And throughout the year, hundreds of thousands of students watch dance shows, theater performances, literary and musical encounters right at their schools or kindergarten. Um, and often they make their way to the actual theaters. The special education kindergartens also take part in this culture or it, cultural basket, but it's much more challenging for them to find the appropriate material for the children. So thanks to an exciting collaboration we started with the Ministry of Education this year, every show that has been adapted by the Safe Place Project goes into a kind of inner invent inventory from which the teachers can more easily invite shows that have been specifically tailored for the needs of the special education children. Um, nearing 2020, we've been working on more such collaborations with community centers and public institutions. The demand is enormous, and there's no better feeling than to allow these children this opportunity. The adapted shows, now reborn as relaxed performances, provide their creators with the chance to showcase their works to new audiences. Um, and just a, 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 a little uh, note aside, I just want to say that in the world today, there are incredible theater groups that produce and perform relaxed uh, performances all year round. 
and they are indeed experts in their field. Uh, the artistic director of Oily Cars is here, so Oily Cars is, is definitely one of the groups. We, we were privileged to study with the three of the best groups, so it's Oily Cars, and it's uh, from the UK, Sensorium Theatre from Australia, and Trusty Sidekick Company from the USA. I highly recommend following their work. So, I invite you to ask me anything you would like to know, and also hear about the simplicity of inclusion and how to make it a daily matter and not a project. Mm -hmm. uh, also, anyone who would like to hear about the workshops that we give and more of our uh, collaborations, please, let's have a beer. Yeah. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a dramatic sentence for the end. <laughs> so this is my email. Thank you very much. about that. No, seriously, because I've been doing TYA for many years, and, and now I'm doing this in the, oh, but it's also the field of so TYA. So 10, is it, is the age of the kids? It really varies, because uh, we don't put it into age groups, actually. Um, I'll pass along also our uh, program. It's in Hebrew, of course, but you can see uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, the age group is, uh, we write like from three and above because a child that is 12 years old uh, can come to a show that is, suits four years old, but it will suit him great, and these are things uh, that happen. Uh, so you can pass it along. Uh, I forgot to say that also this year in our program, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's on the right to left. <laughs> forgot to say that we also had two things that we tried out this year, and it went very well. We put a list of triggers on the description of every show. So like if there's water in the show or mm -hmm. soap bubbles, we just put the list of triggers. We give the family the responsibility. They choose if they know their child the best. And we had an exciting collaboration with the train theater. Uh, they made a show, a relaxed performance for only five children. And it was premiered last week in our um, festival. So in this, so this is like very, very new in Israel. Um, people are still trying to, to understand why a, a, a show for five children. So we put a lot of energy in just explaining why and the importance of it. The yeah. issue is I presented at our festival from Dorian Bonsu, which is beautiful and it's very Yes, this is the show I saw. Oh, but I had two mothers bringing this 21-year-old boy mm -hmm. who developmentally they came, but it was a different, it's a very different thing, that show, because they're grown men. Complex, that's all. Let's agree that it's all complicated, yeah. anyway, <laughs> and that there's no right answer, because there are so many approaches. Uh, we just try to make our best. <laughs> Can anyone maybe share about inclusion in their country, or... Yes, Danny. Well, I to, okay, uh, there was an interesting sort of journey in the UK <coughs> with this stuff, and I'll, I'll be a bit ultra bit brief, and I'm sure I'll touch it here. But it started because I think in about 2010, 2011, there was a family with an autistic child that went to see a performance in the West End of Wicked. Yes. And this became a sort of national scandal because the family were asked if, because their child was making involuntary noises, they were asked by a member of staff if they'd kindly leave the auditorium because they were upsetting everyone. Yeah. <coughs> and they campaigned, and they still campaign. And as a result of it, we have a, a conference at the Unicorn Theatre for Children in London about autism in theatre. And I think from there sprung a lot of... of, of, of there was already some work going on with relaxed forms. I think the cinema industry yeah. in the UK had led the way a bit before theatre. 
Um, and I remember one contribution at that, that conference that, 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 um, that, that was a light bulb moment for me, which was uh, one of the contributors said, why is it one lack performance in mainstream theatres? And they, the analogy they gave is, is in the UK, in trains, you have one quiet coach. And so if you want to be quiet, you go to the quiet coach. Not if in Israel, it doesn't work in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just the well, same. Yeah. <laughs> For obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so they said, so why do we go, there's one relaxed performance and 105 uptight performances, because that's the opposite. <laughs> and why don't we just say, you can, ha if, if it's a problem for you to be with neurodiverse people, we'll do one performance for you and all the rest will be relaxed. <laughs> yeah. And I thought it was a really interesting provocation. And now my understanding is, uh, although I, uh, is that uh, one of our art centres, Bassey Art Centre, has dedicated itself that every performance will be yeah. a relaxed performance. And I think this is largely because there's a, a wonderful artist called Jess Tom, some of you might know, who, 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 who has Tourette's and uses her Tourette's as part of her aesthetic. Brilliantly, she did an amazing production of Beckett's Not I, um, which was the, the best thing I've seen for about a decade at Bassey Art Centre. And every performance that Jess does is relaxed because she wants to, to, to create work. Yes. Because she couldn't, I mean, she was thinking to herself, but, you know, because she couldn't be a theatre member of the theatre audience because of her involuntary I think they are the most progressive in the adult. Uh, so, theater. but uh, it's extraordinary that her influence in that. And there's, I mean, I've performed and I've worked a couple of shows there, and and, um, and from, for me as an artist, I absolutely welcome the fact that I now know the next thing I do there will be relaxed performance, every performance, um, out in about five spaces in the building. Oh. You know, which so we're, it's new, so it'd be really interesting to see how it. But I think it's the first time I've come across that. that or access policy for Paul any Polka was doing, he was a starting relax show. Yeah. We invented it. A children's theatre invented it. Has been doing it for, for a long time. Yeah. So it's come from our world. I know, the UK the is like the, the, the leadership of the relaxing yeah. policies. I know. I get a lot, of, a lot of my knowledge from the UK groups, of course. Yeah. And could, yeah. I, could I ask a question? Sure. Um, the, the cultural breadbasket, um, <laughs> yes. I heard about years ago, and I thought was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've heard about the Norwegian rucksack and the Danish suitcase and the Faroe <laughs> Island something else. And in the UK, in the UK, we're trying uh, an art backpack. That's our version. But so it's the uh, same shows coming to, to it's the all kindergarten. Arts. It's a yeah, all arts coming to the kindergartens and schools. It's five arti artistic outings a year for primary children across the arts that we will guarantee. Like. Five healthy things a day keep you well. Five. <laughs> it's five, minimum five artistic happenings either in or out of school uh, every year for every primary child in the UK. But I recently, um, picking up on your, you you recently tailored it for special education, your mm -hmm. cultural bread basket. And I wondered whether the other, like the Norwegian rucksack and the Danish suitcase and the Finnish handbag. <laughs> And, you know, whether they have thought about this, because uh, we aren't, and I, th I have mentioned it, but it hasn't been listened to, and I, I now feel I can go home and push it a bit more. Yeah, there's a basket inside the basket. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, good. It's smart, much easier to, to reach um, to open the second basket and say, oh, this is, it has a stamp of proof that it's adapted and suitable for these kind of audiences. So but in a way, if you don't mention it, it won't happen. Yeah, of course you, yeah. But it, and we were very, very privileged to have this kind of collaboration. And, and in the Ministry of Education, they were just amazing and very, very <laughs> open. And uh, they come to the shows and they see by themselves. It's not only like people behind desks. They, they really, they mean shit. <laughs> <laughs> and they do it. And it's amazing because the, the main people that are going to profit, like literally profit from it, is the artists. Because the, sh the shows are theirs, they're not ours, we're not uh, like, we don't have like commission from the shows, it's theirs. Mm -hmm. So it's great. Now they, uh, they have a larger, uh, larger options for a larger audience. So I hope it will. Thank you. Yeah. Any 
Anybody else? Any more questions? Yeah, the yeah. question. Um, we do, uh, we got, um, I run a theatre company, we, we do a show a lot, and, and um, more often we're being asked to do a live performance of shows, and some shows um, are clearly are good for it, and some shows I kind of feel like they might not be good for it. And I'm interested because you said at the top that you, you know, select really carefully um, the shows that you think adapt well. I'm wondering whether you think that it might be our responsibility for the shows that we have the sense, having had experience of it, that they're probably not necessarily great as the live performances, but it's our responsibility to tell some venues that actually, you know, we don't think this show is going to be great for a live performance from yeah. our perspective. Well, is that just um, not a useful thing? First of all, not every show can be adapted and become a relaxed performance. Some shows are really, really fast or really, really verbal or too complicated and it's just, they can't be ad adapted. And um, I, I hope I understood your question yeah, correctly. Yeah, well, we, we feel the obligation and, and the responsibility to mostly say yes because we want to be inclusive and we want to make sure that everyone can, um, can you know, get access to our work. But I kind of feel like maybe we shouldn't always. Can I respond to that? Yeah, of course. So I just produced a show and had just been asked to do a relaxed performance at a festival at Going Out, uh, because part of their mandate is that every show provides relaxed performances. Where are you from? Sorry, I'm from Canada, from Vancouver. And um, we're in the middle of a big conversation, which is great, but I'm really clear that the show is completely inappropriate, because it's based on World War I, racism, bullying, and there's freaking bombs that go off in the show. <laughs> and really? I can't, I actually don't know how to do that and not have bombs go off. Like, so because I'm not trained in relaxed performances, and because nobody at the venue that it's going to is trained in relaxed performances, mm. I've been very clear that this show is not appropriate. And had I, and if it's part of your mandate, they need to have that conversation before they hire the artists. So I think as artists, we actually have a responsibility if we believe our show isn't appropriate to be able to explain why, and if they have someone who is an expert in this, who can actually go, show me the video, because I want to see it, and then I can come back with you, and I will totally listen to that, because they they know way more than I do. So I think we do have an, a responsibility to be mindful and to at least say, I don't think it's appropriate, but who do we show the work to who can tell us whether it's appropriate? We have a thing going on in Vancouver right now around um, providing performances to people who um, are deaf or hard of hearing. And um, we have an amazing artist in Vancouver who is deaf and he's educated us all. And just because it's nonverbal doesn't mean it's appropriate. And so I, I'm like, right, okay. I have no idea, this is not my world. You have a different language than I have. And so uh, I feel like it was a similar thing that, that I need to work with, with people who know way more about this to, to decide this approach is uh, it's hard for me to accept it because uh, I really think that we have a lot of responsibility it's like you go to someone who says uh, maybe it's an extreme example okay uh, someone who says he's a doctor but he only watched uh, on YouTube how to become a doctor so it doesn't make him a doctor of course 
uh, if you put the title. So the same here, I, I, I think it has, it needs a lot of research and mainly it needs uh, time to, to check on the audience and to make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. This is how you succeed. And I made so many mistakes in my life and I make it like on an hourly basis. <laughs> <laughs> But really, it's it has it's 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 not just making a TYA show. It's different because of the audience. So you have like extra responsibility. This is this is my approach. No, I, I agree. We program for the bullying because of that. Yeah. So the audience. And they are like experts. Yeah. They are. They're Amazing. Like the audience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not an I was um I always think when there's a show that has a theme of autism or neurodiversity. Um, I was involved in a show, um, I wasn't the maker, um, that was all about autism. And I, from my perspective of the work I do, I, I find the whole process so difficult because there was an, an assumption that something that is about a theme will therefore be good for the people affected by that theme in their day-to-day -day life. And um, yeah, and, and, and for me, um, it was like a highly verbal show performed by people with autism. It was a series of monologues. And you know, it was sort of, I, people were welcome and that was really good, but because um, the theme was there, there was never any thought about thinking about the whole constellation of autism. And actually there were really, there were simple ways we could have made that like way more just engaging and enjoyable, but that wasn't seen as a necessary question or practice, and when I raised it, people became really defensive, and I wasn't in a powerful position in that structure, so I literally just stopped, I stopped asking, because I was like, I just don't think you want this question in the room, and I'm not gonna like, you know, like bulldoze in, and, and also some uh, autistic, you know, a, a cast member with autism kind of disagreed, because that wasn't their experience, so especially then, I was like, oh, <laughs> but really not gonna get in this argument. Um, but I just think there's always that assumption, and from what you said, like if your work is about, that they are like sometimes work can be about and not and not for, and sometimes work can be for and not about, and it, it's wonderful when they all come together. But I've never seen it done fully meaningfully. Like mm -hmm. a really an example I always think of because it haunts me is a, oh it, uh, I hope no one makes a show. <laughs> 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 It was a show about dementia, and the title of it was like bleak. You know, it was about it was like bleak. It, they might as well have called it like death. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were like, oh, we tried to invite loads of people with dementia to see it, oh. and it just broke my heart because I was like, yeah. what have you got to tell them about their experience? You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Who, who are you? Like, and yeah. so I don't know. I think it's an exceptionally complicated thing to try and do all those things in yeah. one. On the history of autism is great. The parents went and said, I learned more in that hour. And any doctor has taught me in 20 years of my child, but their child is triggered. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? yeah, yeah. What do you do? I'm one of the performers in the and I was called the Tiger. And what I found the most um, surprising about the process was that in, the, in order to develop the piece, it's, it's so central, I had to drop every preconception of autism that I had because I couldn't, I can't predict how the audience are going to respond yeah. to anything that I do. I kind of just have to trust uh, a little bit of my instinct with taking a risk with that and it has to be okay to make mistakes in that environment in order for it to be successful, whatever uh, the measurement of successful is. Um, so in terms of triggers and stuff, like I have thought that loud noises and light changes and things like that were bad, which might be the case for some people, but for other people who are autistic, that could be like an overwhelmingly, incredibly positive response and things like that. So that's what I found quite interesting. It's a spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. It's a spectrum, yeah. yeah. But there are some things, yeah. I've done a lot of work with children with autism, so my experience is yeah. that loud sounds can be one of the triggers. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I'm not an expert yeah. in any way. I'm just, the sh I'm just like, this is not the show, people. Yeah. So 
so I want it to be uber cautious. And, uh, and, uh, but you're right, there could be children in to watch that show who are like, it was great, we love these sounds. I always feel like it's a drop, of, a drop in the sea what we do. And it's like, you can never win yeah. because it's the spectrum. But you can try. So this is what leads me, anyway. Sorry, I just want to add something um, in terms of from the artist's perspective. I also think I'm a presenter, primarily, and it's really important to me, it, the same way that I am with Q&A, is that uh, artists have to be okay to do the live performances. Of course. Right? Mm -hmm. I can't just, as a presenter, or even as a producer, go, well, now we're doing a live performance, and the conversation needs to happen up front. Yeah. Same with Q&As. I know some artists love doing Q&As, some artists hate doing Q&As, and I completely respect that. So if I need that, I'm, that needs to be the conversation up front as part of the audition and hiring process, that this show is going to have relaxed performances. These are the audiences we're looking at. They are gonna have all of those things so that artists have agency over the decisions they make in terms of where and how they want to perform yeah, their work. I, I really agree, and um, part of the things that are important for me uh, when I search for a good show, uh, is who are the people behind it. So I'm happy that a lot of them are my friends, mm -hmm. but I need people that, that you know, they don't do it uh, just to, to, to get rich, you know, because they really, they're really intrigued and interested, and I cannot work with artists that cannot be fully in the process of this incredible thing that they are, going to give the children. So uh, it, it, it's, it's something that leads me also when I uh, think of, I might see a, a really, really good production that is, is really suitable, but I know the artist or the theater might be, you know, they don't really care or it, they just do it for, again, for like PR, then I, I will not work with them. So it's, it's, not, it's not worth it. Yes? It's just quick to respond to that question really, because I think it's problematic, <coughs> which is, you know, a human rights approach. And I say this as an artist, but I, I know that there are, for example, you take Thomas Hibbelin, uh, Simon Fraser, for example, mm -hmm. I've known instances where there have been artists who said, I won't have it because it will ruin my stage picture. And you say, well, there's a human right of the deaf person to access the performance, mm -hmm. and so maybe as a presenter, one has an obligation to say, I'm not, you can't work here as an artist because effectively you're excluding people on, on the grounds of their impairment. And the same could be true, you could say about, about relaxed performances, you're, 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 you're effectively saying I'm excluded in, and your obligation and responsibility as an artist is I'm on the side not to exclude anyone on the basis of something they can't hope to fix. And that's on the first. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is there's two approaches of this kind of that the work that exists and kind of bolting on access, but there's also a, a bit like the work that Haley Hart do and, and others, there's a sense that there's an aesthetics of access, that you start from there and it's, it's an artistic impulse for an artist, and it makes the work actually richer. Um, by It feels like a limitation, but it's actually fantastic. You know, I know artists in the UK who, who, who are sort of gagging to see or any carts work sometimes because they're, they're told that the scenography and the sound and the aesthetic is so innovative. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a small audience, there's about 10, five to 10 people in there. Can't get in and see the fantastic stuff. But, you know, it's, it, I, and I think there's a lot of other examples um, which have happened around, for example, inclusive audio description and sound and, and sensory impairment as well as stuff around property impairment. And I've, I've, I've become interested in embracing the idea that you start from the point that we want to include every human being as an artist in the making of the show. So how are we going to make sure that people who are neurodiverse are included in our audience as an artist as, as, as an artist mm -hmm. as an artist? And I say that as someone who's got loads of words in the that I do um, and have a show with, with you know, a, a, an artistic hope that it's quite foreground. I don't know the answer to it always, but it's not a limitation, but always stimulation. But I think there's it's such a wonderful strand of this work there. It's really well put together. I was just thinking of the same thing I did with Leanne. We, one thing, we worked with 
So I was put in this position of like, oh, um, maybe we could train the venue. And um, but it was really, so I collaborated with a young guy uh, with autism who communicates through an iPad. And he did the sensory audits of the venue. And um, it, what I completely adored about that process um, was he uh, wouldn't have done that without, um, he wouldn't have found his way to that himself. But then he was in this really powerful position and you could see it in his whole body. Like, <laughs> he was like really <laughs> articulate. And by the end, he was just totally like in inhibiting that role. And like, it gave him this like force, like it, ma it meant loads to him doing that. Like he, he, his, his mum kept telling me like, and I think there's something really there's like uh, as a future, as a way of like keeping developing, and I thought that was that was the first time I'd ever like done that, and I, and I thought that's a really nice direction too to like include those young people as self advocates. And, uh, but he needed some support enabling to be to self advocate. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then once he he was, he was like he was ready to go. Like he didn't need much support then. That's <laughs> amazing. And he said, "Okay, stop telling them off now." Like, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming.